everyone. Uh, good morning to all our students online as well. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's thank God for this new week uh, that he has blessed us with. And then we'll get into our session. Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity you've given us to come into your presence. And even as we learn together, God, we pray that you will continue to minister, continue to strengthen us, strengthen our inner man. And Lord, we thank you for all that we are learning. And we pray, God, that we will not just be hearers of your word, but we will also be doers of your word, God. We, we submit this time into your hands. We submit this week uh, into your hands, Lord. May your name be glorified in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week we did chapter 8. We talked about understand and reason. Most importantly, we talked about how the Apostle Paul was able to reach out uh, when he went into his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 17. He goes into uh, Athens, right? And what does he do? He ministers to them. We learned on uh, you know, how he was able to practically bring the gospel to uh, those who were living there. And also, uh, we looked at understanding Hindus and Muslims uh, when we are evangelizing, right? when we are speaking to people, we must understand uh, where they are coming from, what are their belief system. All of that is important to help us minister well. Okay, so today we'll get into chapter 9. Let's try and cover chapter 9 and chapter 10 today. Uh, Chapter 9, witness and demonstrate. Right Now, witness is what? Sharing the gospel. Demonstrate is what? Showing you're living the gospel. Now, yeah, I'm sure we've heard that saying, no? Practice what you preach. Don't just be preaching. Practice what you preach. Meaning what? When we are witnessing to about Jesus, we must also practice it. We must demonstrate who Jesus is and what he does. Okay? So witness, how can we witness? One, we can witness through our life testimony. When people look at our life, say, hey, something about him. How come all of them around me in my school or my college, all of them around me in my workplace are, you know, enjoying, drinking, living a lavish life and using bad language. You know, they just, everyone are doing that. But how come this boy or this girl is not doing anything? Now, you know, the interesting thing is sometimes we feel that nobody is watching. But remember, every time everyone is watching, people watch, people learn, right? So when, when we demonstrate by our life testimony, it speaks a lot to people, right? Two is what you say. Not only it's written there, share the gospel, but also how you portray yourself, right? Life testimony, what do you speak? Everyone say speak, right? Speak means we can speak good things. We can speak wrong things. We can speak what is good. We can speak what is evil. The choice is ours. So two ways to witness our life testimony and what we say. Two is how can we demonstrate the gospel? One, through power. We talked about this in a few chapters before. How did Jesus minister to people? In compassion and in power. Right. So, so you and I must develop this ability to balance both. Was Jesus compassionate and loving? Was he powerful? But he was able to manage both. Right? In some places, he was very quiet. In some places, he was very stern. If you read Matthew 24, he's so, the Lord Jesus is so upset. He's so stern. He's saying, you are a, a vipers. You are living a life of hypocrisy. But he was also humble, that he was willing to go to the poor and, this, and, the, and the weak people. 
So one is demonstrate with power and demonstrate in love. Now, what, what does that mean? As a believer, you love one another, right? So for example, now in church, it's very easy. Jai Masi Ki, praise the Lord, God loves you. We can say all that. But what about in the workplace? Nobody, there's no Jai Masi Ki there. Okay, everyone say hi. And all, all, all everyone's talking about work. And say, I worked in the corporate sector for many years, so I know. No, uh, I, I spent a lot of, I spent a year after I became a believer just staying at home and praying the whole day, praying. Then I realized, hey, I have to get a job, I have to work. Because Paul said, if you don't work, don't eat. So I went and got a job. And when I got a job, it was a complete shift. Here, only praise the Lord, Jai Masiki. Here in the workplace, there is exactly the opposite that's happening. So how can I be a testimony there? How can I walk in love, yet walk in power? Now, walking in love doesn't mean that whatever people say, you accept it. No, you have to walk in power. You have to walk in authority also. So as believers, we must develop this ability. So for example, you're in the workplace. Somebody says, you know what? Uh, I'm going through a very difficult time. Right Now, don't just say, okay, God loves you. That he probably knows. But use the power of God that is in you. Right? Ask that person, hey, I know you're going through this difficult time. I went through this difficult time as well. But when I prayed, God helped me. So can I pray for you? What, what is happening? You're demonstrating in power. You may be a very quiet person in office. Don't talk to anybody, minding your own business. But you also have the power of God. Dunamis power. Right? What is dunamis? Dynamite. You know, when you burst crackers, you see in those big dynamite crackers. That's the power that's in you. Right? Now, the wrong way to use this power is you know, to boast about it. This is what I can do. When I pray for people, people will be healed. When I pray for people, this will, you know, people will be restored. That's why they stand in the line. Now, that's all boastful. So, love and compa compassion is one side. Power and authority is on the other side. Now, you and I must be able to balance it. Where does power and authority come? Power and authority comes for us as believers when we look at what the enemy is doing. Right? So the enemy is you know, oppressing somebody, maybe your friend or somebody in your family. Uh, there's oppression, there's troubles, constant troubles. You use the authority of God. Right? You know, now, of course, we can say, you know, God, I know you love me. I know you are always there for me. All that is there, but now is the time to take the weapon of authority and to use it right so we must learn how to balance it so let's read matthew chapter 5 13 through 16 very common passage matthew 5 13 through 16 uh, matthew 5 is the beatitudes yes could anyone read do you have the mic matthew chapter 5 13 through 16 You are you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lose its uh, saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and tremble underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Yes. Look at Jesus. He's using two aspects. One is salt. Now, if you look at Jew, during the uh, during Jesus' time, right? Salt was used for two things. What do we use salt for right now? Salt. Why do we use salt? Taste and, yes. Taste and one more. 
Oh, you should know this. Right? Salt is used for taste, and it's used as a preservative. Right. So, if for example, if you make um, if you make something, you make you know pickles. You have to put salt in it. It is used as a preservative. Now, during those days, there was no fridge for Jesus. Jesus didn't have a fridge during those times, right? So what would they do? They would, you know, when they made food, example, fish, they would go fishing, they would get the fish, they would put salt on it and keep it. So what's happening? The salt will preserve the food. It won't get spoiled. So they can keep it for two, three days and eat it. One, salt gives taste. Two, salt is a preservative. So Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, it's of no use. Meaning what? What is Jesus trying to say? Your life is a testimony. If we lose our saltiness, there is no use. We are not, we are not being of any use for the kingdom of God. We may be useful on earth. But for the kingdom of God, there's no use. Then he says, you are the light of the world. How many of us like to live in darkness? None of us, right? I remember we went to, uh, quite a few months back, we went to uh, missions, uh, uh, and this was in Rajasthan, right? And in the daytime, it's so beautiful. It's in the villages. Very beautiful. You got chickens running everywhere, goats, everything is there. Oh, it's so beautiful. And then comes the night. In the night time, there is pitch darkness. I thought to myself, what kind of place is this? I was waiting for the daytime to come because there was nothing around. One lamppost far away, one light. Nothing is there. Entire place is dark. Right? Uh, but in the daytime, it's so beautiful. I thought to myself that day, you see how important light is. Light changes things around us. It just changes the atmosphere. Jesus is saying, you are the light. When you go to places, in places of darkness, places where the enemy has brought darkness, you're going to bring light. Two examples, he says. In verse 16, he says so powerfully, he says, let your light shine. So that when people see your good deeds, they will glorify the Father in heaven. What is that? Your life testimony. Right? And Jesus is saying, this is for all of us. He's not, it's not for just the disciples. It's for all of us. Our life has to reflect who Jesus is. Let people see who Jesus is through the life we live. Now, is this going to be easy or is this going to be difficult? Is it easy or difficult? It's very difficult. If it's easy for you, wonderful. For me, it's very difficult. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit inside us enables us to live that life. For example, I'm not able to forgive somebody. This person did something wrong to me. Past one year, I'm holding that you know, unforgiveness. When I meet the person, it's OK. Hi, how are you? Everything's OK. Out outwardly, it's OK. But inwardly, I'm, I still have that anger. You know, one year back, he did this to me. Now, on my own strength, I will not be able to forgive. But if I'm able to forgive, people will see that. It will it'll be a life testimony for people who are watching you. It will show. Amen? Right? And that's what Jesus is saying here. Then we witness through what we say, that is the gospel. Know the gospel so that you can share it simply and clearly. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Let's read that. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Go ahead. 
First Peter chapter two and verse nine. But you are a chosen people, a royal uh, priesthood, a holy nation, God's special position, uh, position, that you may declare the praise of Him. You call you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Mm. You are a chosen generation, that you may declare His purposes, and declare what His word says. Now, here's the important point. Uh, we've been talking about this in this in this one sentence is know how to share the gospel simply and clearly you say this word after me simple say the word simple and clear right now sometimes we can take something a message and make it all go round and round and round and confuse the person Right? You can take a simple message. So, for example, I say, I tell one of you, uh, can you please go and I want to communicate. Can you please go close the main gate of the Bible college and come back? Right? It's a simple message. It's clear. But what if I have to say this? You know what? In the last one year, there was theft, thieves have increased. Crime rate has increased to 10%. So from 10% in 2024, it's going to become 15%. Crime rate is going to become 15%. Many thieves are there. So what I feel is that we must all be protected. I know that God is protecting us. I know that Psalms 91 says he will set your angels in charge of us. So here's what I feel. Can one of you please go and close the gate? Now, I'll tell you how to go to the gate. You go upstairs, take a lift, go straight. And if the gate is open, you close it. Now, what have I done? I've taken two minutes to say one, one thing. It was a simple thing. All I had to say is, Joseph, go close the gate and come. He knows. But what did I do? I made it one big, one example. <laughs> And everything I brought in, are you understanding what I'm trying to say? And I don't have to complicate it. It's very simple. The gospel also is very simple. It's a simple gospel. Learn to you know, um, share it in a very simple way. And be clear with what you speak. Right? So sometimes we are preparing for a message. We prepare the message. Uh, even I have made these mistakes, right? Prepare the message. Everything I know from the Bible is in one message. From Moses till Jesus' second coming. Everything is there in that message. What's happening? After the message, of, uh, you know, the people who are listening, the, what is the message title? What is the message about? He spoke about everything he knows. What is the message about? What he spoke was truth. What he spoke was from the Bible. But it was not clear. Right? That's why we have sermon topics. Right? So that we learn how to be clear in what we speak. So while ministering the gospel, be clear. Be simple, be clear. Right? We have all sinned. Sin needs to be taken care of. So because of the sin, we were separated from God. Very simple. Right? And what happens is the person who's listening will be able to understand it very clearly. Do not be ashamed about the gospel because it is the power of God. We talked so much about this. Demonstrate the power of God. Expect God to use you in works of power. Now, when you are ministering to people, don't ever feel that I don't know anything. Don't ever feel, oh, I am not a uh, you know, healing evangelist. I am not a pastor. I am not a... Uh, you know, apostle, I am not a prophet. Don't feel all those things. Those are just titles that man has made. What does the Bible say? Ephesians 4 talks about it. Every believer is a minister. If you believe in Jesus, God's power is in you. So whether you're in the workplace, whether you're a college student, whether you're, uh, you're a housewife, you're a, uh, you know, you're just working somewhere, 
doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is not going to say, oh, you're not in full-time ministry, I'll go somewhere else. No. You know, many times I talk to youth, and this is what this is the problem that I notice. So, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not equipped enough, or I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not able to pray for people. Why? You can pray. There's nothing wrong. <clears throat> because when you are praying for people, it is, are you the healer? Am I the healer? Who's the healer? If I'm praying for people, if I get a prophecy, is it my word or is it God's word? So there's no pressure on me. I'm initially, I was also, what if he doesn't get healed? I'm praying for people, what if he doesn't get healed? What if his problem is not solved? Listen, you and I can never take the place of God. We can't take God's place. God knows how to do. He has asked us, you pray, you pray. Pray in faith. Expect God to do miracles. If I don't expect anything, how will I see results? If I don't expect, if I don't expect, okay, I want to start my own ministry, I will not be able to do anything. That's why the Bible says, no hope. You need to have hope. Hope is very important. So it says here, expect God to use you in works of power. If you are planning to start your own ministry, expect God to work. Don't say, okay, I'll just start something. No. If you're praying for somebody who's sick, there are five people. Oh, God, only five people. No, expect God to work. No, in that five people. Let healing happen. Let miracles happen. You may not have the role of a pastor and prophet and healing evangelist, all of that. That doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is not looking for the, all those titles. He's looking for those who are willing to step out and walk in faith. Okay? Right? So never feel, you know, sometimes the enemy will say, you, you, you don't know anything. You don't know the Bible. You don't know. You're very, very soft. You're a very quiet person. I don't think this is what you have to do. No. The moment you become believers, you can pray in faith. Okay? So are we going to expect? Yes? Right? So many times, you know, uh, as a young, I was very young, I used to go to these places uh, and reach, minister to people, conferences and all of these things. And many times I would go thinking, okay, what will they, you know, I'm a young boy, what if I don't do well? What if they look down on me? And God had to break that. Right? He says, Paul, I've called you. You do what I am telling you to do. Rest, you look. I look after it. I thank God for that because all that, you know, burden. Oh, I have to see miracles. What if miracles don't happen? Then nobody will call me next time for the conference. All of those fears just went away. And when that went away, I was able to, able to minister in freedom. Right? So expect God to use you. Two, use your authority. Do you have authority? Yes? Where is that authority? Sorry? Matthew chapter 10. Okay, what, what does it say? Sorry? Yeah, say, say it to me. Mm, mm, mm. Everyone understood that? I've given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Right? Now, authority must be used in wisdom. Yes, everyone say wisdom. God gives you authority, but you also need to have wisdom. Authority without wisdom will become a Failure. Passion without wisdom again will become a failure. Why? Why am I saying failure? Because when I say failure, it's not like you will not do anything. What I mean is we may not be fruitful in what we are doing. Right? See the Lord Jesus, best example. Some places he went, he drove out demons and the sick people were healed. But when he went to his hometown, there were no miracles. 
And, and people wanted, oh, who are you? Why are you coming here? You're saying you're the Messiah. People were ridiculing him. So what did Jesus do? Just went away. Did he have the authority? Yes. But he just went to the other cities. So if they don't want, what can I do? I'll go. So authority and wisdom. He knew his life was in danger. He went away. Jesus didn't say, you know, I will stay here only. I'll, I have the authority. I will stay here. No. He was wise. He moved out. He went to other cities, ministered, and he came back. Right? So we must use our authority also with wisdom. Now, when we use authority, be bold, okay? Be bold. Don't, don't feel shy. Don't feel weak. Uh, don't feel like, oh, I can't do this. No. Be bold. Right? If you're praying for people, boldly pray. Lord, bring healing. Right? The moment you tell yourself, I don't know if you'll be healed, and then you pray, then what will happen? Nothing will happen. You'll be bold. Use the authority God has given you. God will work through all believers. Right? So all of us. God will work through all of us. Demonstrate the love of God. Be compassionate. Do good to those who are around you, meaning genuinely care, genuinely love people. Right? I, I like what Apostle Paul says, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He's saying, you may have prophecy, word of knowledge, uh, working of miracles, all these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if you have all of this, but if you do not have love, it's like two empty vessels banging each other. That means it's like a sounding gong, only sound. Are miracles happening? Yes. Are uh, people being blessed? Yes. But if there's no love, for God, it is nothing. Remember this. God works in spite of us. That means it's not that just because I prayed, God is working. Or just because I read the Bible for one hour, just because I'm a believer for the past five years, God is working. No. God will work in spite of us. That means even if we, at times, even if we don't pray, even if we don't spend time in God's word, God will work. Are you understanding what I'm saying, right? Our ministry, the results of our ministry is not directly dependent on us. God can do greater things, but we have just spent you know, very little time with God. But He can work, right? But He does ask us, you know, he, He's taught us to you know, pray and read the word, and He will bless the work of our hands. But remember, God works in spite of us. It's not, it's not because I prayed God brought healing. It's not because I read the word God brought healing. If God wants to bring healing, he will bring a healing. Look at the Old Testament example. Just one example. Look at Naman. He had leprosy. Right? Everyone know that story? Naman, he had leprosy. Did he pray? What did he do? The servant said, go. There's a prophet, he'll pray for you, you'll be healed. He didn't pray. Look at the, the man in, in the New Testament, the man who was uh, bedridden for 38 years at the pool of Siloam. What happened to him? He's there for so many years. Did he pray, Jesus, please heal me? Jesus went, healed him and went. So there are times God works even when we don't do anything. So we are not to boast about it. Right? You understand? Trust God that when I'm ministering, when you're ministering to people, God will touch people's lives. Right? Okay. Let's go to chapter 10. Praying for the unsaved. Now, this is very important. The real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. Right? When we talk about people, what is the first thing that comes to our mind when we say people? Ministry is about people. 
can we do ministry without people there is no ministry you you will be ministering to yourself if there are no people right ministry is about people so how can we pray for people praying for those who are unsaved and what must we learn even as we are doing that remember the devil does not want people from other faiths to understand the gospel because if they understand what jesus did god can touch their lives they can change right god can just change their lives in a moment their lives can change so what does the devil do he stops people from believing he brings in all these evil thoughts evil ideas he blinds them so how does satan stop uh, uh, satan's work in hindering the salvation of the lost let's look at some of them here number 1 he blinds the minds of the people everyone have eyes we have eyes we can see our mind also have eyes right how do you know if i if i say something you'll think about it computer you're thinking of a computer you're seeing it in your mind's eyes bicycle fruits right what's what's happening you're seeing it in your mind's eye now what the devil does is he blinds that mind's eye right he blinds the people in the mind right let's read uh, maybe one verse here second corinthians 4 3 and 4 second corinthians chapter 3 and verse 4 Sorry, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three and four. And and even if our gospel is will, it is will to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded mm. the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. What is veil? veil is a covering and it goes on he says the gospel is the the devil blinds the minds of people number one way of blinding people's mind is deception everyone say deception deception means to tell what is truth to whatever is truth to make people believe it's a lie okay and whatever is a lie to make them believe it's a truth that's called deception whatever is truth make people believe it's a lie whatever is a lie make people believe it's a truth so that is the number one tool that the devil uses against people deception what does he do he keeps people in darkness oh, no don't believe this See, I'll tell you something. This boy told you about Jesus, no? How can it be? How can it be? You, 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 you read the Bible. You see what is written about Jesus, right? The devil will put them into darkness. No, that's. This is all written by human beings. All written by human beings. They've written stories. There's no proof. Where is? Where's the proof that Moses is uh, burning bushes there? as a proof he puts people under deception another way what does he say uh, you know this this christianity is a foreign god they they this it's all you know made up stories there is no jesus how can god become man no what so what happens the person is still in blind he's blind now satan himself knows but the person is put in darkness deception and what's the second way he'll say instead of that no i'll show you a better god this god you can do if you worship this god you can do everything you want to do you can drink you can smoke you can live in sexual immorality you can do whatever you want 
no problem. Oh, who's that God? Oh, see, this God is there. So what is truth? He's deceiving people and he's making it as a lie. You understood? Right? Deception, number one. He blinds the people. Jesus did not die on the cross. He did not die. Jesus was just another person. He was a good man. I'm not saying he's not a good man. He was a good man. But he lived and he died. What is that? Deception. Have you heard of people saying, Jesus is a good man, but he's not God? It's deception. It's the devil's way of blinding people. Two, he holds people in bondage. Everyone say bondage. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's read that. Everyone know what is bondage, right? Bondage means to, it's like a yoke, keeping somebody tied up. That's called bondage. Let's read 2 Ephesians 2.2. 2. In which you in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Mm. The spirit who is now at work at the, with those who are disobedient. So what does the devil do? He puts people in prisons. You know, you've seen prisons, right? He put them in a prison. That's like a bondage. That he'll tie them up and put them inside. You can't come out. You're going to be, a, um, you know, an alcoholic all your life. I'll put you into one prison. That's called bondage. Or I'll put you into another prison where he's got, you know, uh, every everything that they do is failure. That's one prison. So you've got all these prison cells and all these bondages that Satan does over people. Right? Now, bondages can also be in the mind. What is, what is temptation? You know how, how people get into bondages? Four stages. Number one, temptation comes in the thinking, in our thought. Right? All of us, temptation comes in the thought. After that, it becomes imagination. Right? So temptation comes. Why don't you... Example, right? Why don't you drink alcohol? Temptation comes. Now, at that moment, if I don't cancel that thought, what will happen? It will become imagination. Imagination is what? You will imagine, oh, I am sitting and drinking. Now, at that time also, if I don't cancel, it will go to the next step, which is conception. It's okay, no. Right? Arguments, reasoning. It's okay, there's nothing wrong. Right? Once a while is okay. Once a month, once in two months. Reasoning. Then from there, it will go to conception. The sin will be committed. And then because we commit sin again and again, Satan will open one door and he'll say, please enter. And we'll enter. That's a bondage. Now the devil wants to keep people in bondage. He doesn't want to release them. He doesn't want people to know about Jesus. So he keeps them in that darkness. And then he will use other ways, you know, uh, on point number three, hindering the proclamation of the gospel. He will infiltrate the church. That means he'll come within the church, cause problems. Or he will try all this anti-conversion bill and uh, persecutions. All of these things he'll try so that the gospel does not go out to many places. Because he knows if the gospel is preached, people's lives will be touched. He knows it. The devil knows. Imagine, you know, like for example, like we, we go into a place in, say, in our, in our nation. There's very less Christianity. So imagine a, a preacher says, okay, we are going to have two days conference. Okay, this preacher says there's no, there are so many thousands of people, but very few Christians. So this evangelist says, we'll go and do two days conference. So now the devil will try his best to stop, to stop that conference. He will try to bring sickness. He will try to bring problems. He will try to use, you know, government to stop that 
uh, this thing, he will use everything he can to stop that conference. But somehow God will make sure that the conference happens. Then what he will try? He will try, okay, nobody should come to that conference. Right? So what? Persecutions. Right? Uh, if, if some people are giving out tracts, hey, we have a uh, you know meeting, evangelist is coming, we're preaching the gospel, then some people will pers bring persecution. So then no evangelism is happening. Because he knows if people go and sit in that conference, and if they hear the word of God, and if that word of God goes into their heart, gone for me. They will believe. Now, if they believe, all that bondage is gone. My devils won't have any work. Now, become becomes a believer. See, for how for us, no? One person becomes a believer, there's rejoicing in heaven. Yes or no? Right? The Bible says. But for the devil, if one person becomes a believer, there's big trouble for him. You understand? So the devil will stop the proclamation of the gospel. Whether it's in your city, it could be a conference, it could be Bible study in your house, it could be you talking one-on-one -on -one with a person. He will try to stop it. Because he knows the power of the gospel. Right? What is the church's responsibility? The church is to be the light to the Gentiles. To open prison doors, to bring people from darkness into the light. That's our responsibility. Are you the church? Yes? No, the church is not a building. You and I are the church. It's our responsibility to open prison doors. How do we do that? We preach the gospel, we minister to people. And yesterday we talked about, you know, in church, we talked about. Uh, the gospel going beyond our nation and the nations. Second one, the church has kingdom authority and spiritual weapons to overthrow what the devil is doing. Now, Jesus is not saying, go preach the gospel. He's saying, yes, go preach, but I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you spiritual weapons. Imagine a king of a kingdom, right? He's being attacked. And he says, okay, army, get ready. Army is getting ready, but they don't have any tools. They don't have the spear. They don't have anything, bow and arrows, nothing they have. All they have is some stones. And the king says, take how many of our stones and go fight the enemy. The enemy is coming with the bow and arrow, spear, shield. They put on full the armor of, uh, you know, the armor that the army people wear. But this king is saying, take stones and throw. It's not going to work. The king should say, hey, get the equipment required for the army. Give them the tools. Give them the weapons that they need to fight the enemy. Now, when they have the weapons, they'll be able to fight. Right? So Jesus is saying, come on, I'm going to give you weapons you use this weapon i am sending you to overthrow the works of the devil just use the weapons i'm giving you let's read this verse um matthew chapter 12 28 and 29 and also second corinthians chapter 10 3 to 6 maybe one of them can open to second corinthians chapter 10 3 to 6 But if, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his position unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house? Mm. Yes. Also read Second Corinthians 10, 3 and 6. This is a powerful Pastor, portion. Can I read? Yes, please go ahead, Gertrude. Yeah. Um, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God 
for pulling down strongholds. Yes. Paul is writing here and he's saying the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Right? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all these obedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Yes. Right. So here, what does it say? The Paul is saying the weapons of our warfare. Always remember, you and I, as believers, we are in a constant battle with the devil, right? With the spiritual forces that are working in and around us. Though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are carnal, but might in God, pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginary arguments, every high thing that is God is there, then the knowledge of God can Okay. All right. Every thought to captivity. All right. Thank you, Gertrude. Uh, I think you're on. You're you've not muted, so. Okay. All right. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God. Do you have weapons? What are they? Tell me some of the weapons you use. Prayer. Okay. What else? Word of God. Very good. What else? What are the other weapons you use? Blood of uh, Jesus Christ. Blood of Jesus. Sorry? Sorry? Commanding, okay, yes. What else? Come on. Name Everybody. of Jesus. The name of Jesus, yes. What else? Your authority. So many things. Faith. Faith is what? It's it's a it's a, it's 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 a breastplate. You've got your breastplate of righteousness. You got the sword of the spirit. You got so much. You know, unknowingly you use the weapons, but you don't know you're using it. And then that's how God has made it, right? He's not sending us into the battlefield. Okay, go fight, go fight. No. He's saying, go fight. I'm giving you the weapons. Right? So on the basis of the finished work of the cross, we use the spiritual authority that God has given us and we destroy the strongholds on people's lives. So when people come, demon-possessed people, people who are going through sicknesses, people who are going through spiritual blindness, when you pray, use the weapons of your warfare. You pray for healing. You pray for deliverance. It's like you're going to the devil. You're opening the prison doors and saying, come out. Come to the light. That's what you're doing. Imagine you're going to the devil. The Bible says he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So you have the authority, right? Then we bring spiritual transformation by engaging in worship, prayer, and exercise spiritual authority, right? So what do we do? We go to places. We, uh, you know, you bring spiritual transformation just by spending time in worship spending time in prayer you can do this in your house small groups in your church have uh, uh, you know extended time of prayer fasting and prayer worship you invite people hey we're having fire one hour of worship can you come if they come god can speak to them i always say this nobody preached the gospel to me i was playing guitar for one song and god spoke to me that's how god changed my life so God can speak to people through any way, right? Bringing spiritual transformation. How? Because the presence of God comes and lives are touched. Amen? Right? So we'll stop here. We'll continue from praying for the lost from next class. All right. Have a good day. God bless you all.